Okay, hello everybody. It's uh, Mateusz Szukajdem uh, heading Gamecast, uh, Business and Games. And with us is uh, Bogdan. Can you tell me your surname, how to pronounce it just like 100% properly? Oprescu. Oprescu, okay. Because I, I was thinking uh, Bogdan Oprescu from Walson, uh, Studio Walson Game. And uh, and yeah, that's that's that, that's our, uh, the topic for today. Uh, a bit of changes on uh, on the podcast itself uh, will be. I will be trying to kind of transform it into being a, a standard thing. Uh, hopefully, at least uh, twice a month uh, when it comes to I mean an English uh, speaking episode because we we're uh, traditionally having or always had the Polish version. But I would love to have some uh, also international guests along the way. I think Bogdan is the, the perfect guy for it. Uh, since he's kind of local when it comes to Central Europe, but uh, but also international, mm. and when it comes to uh, you, you you don't work in do you work from France, right? I work from um, both offices, so both from uh, from France and from Romania, mainly Romania. Okay, so you're local, international. That's good. That's that's the yeah. best de delicacy out there. Uh, so yeah, back enough. Uh, I talked, I told you a bit about uh, the podcast as it is. Uh, as, uh, what I do is we try to get uh, more into business of games and uh, less on the designing arts and, and gameplay of, of of games and what they are, but rather treat uh, and talk and uh, discuss the money in it and um, and also I'm guessing HR, you know, hiring. Uh, how to get into business, how to grow in it, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so great to have you here. Thank you for uh, uh, for that you're here. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. Okay, Bogdan, um, let's maybe start with, with your story, because I'm guessing... Uh, do you think that every gamer out there on the planet knows Bolton? Uh, absolutely not. Absolutely. Really? I, I think that that's, that's uh, that you kind of broke the glass ceiling so to say and um, i'm guessing a lot of games are like the majority of gamers especially in the western um, uh, hemisphere sphere or, or part of the business they they probably know you right or that's that's an over assumption i mean a lot of people we were lucky enough to get a lot of people to to buy uh, our first game was lords of mayhem so we did uh, very well uh, in terms of sales, uh, and I think you can call this a, a success, especially for the first uh, game that was uh, released by uh, by Walsa. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean the industry is massive, right? Uh, and uh, it's probably everybody in the industry would have known Walsa. Uh, it would have been a, a very different. Uh, you know, situation, the company would have been much bigger, we would have had um, a lot more games in development, a lot more games released, and so on and so forth. So we are, I think we're barely scratching, scratching the surface uh, to get uh, uh, out there and to be, you know, to put our games in front of as many people as possible. But we have a, a lot of, a long way to go to, to reach them. Well, don't you have this feeling that, uh... That you not only scratched the surface, I, I think that you kind of broke through to it because it's a uh, you sold a few million copies, so you you're out there, right? You're not like in I don't know top fifty to top hundred, right? It's uh, because there's obviously like a a, a very exclusive league league of 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 games and uh, IPs, so you're just right that behind that somewhere along uh, of those games that sold s some millions of games which is also a very uh, exclusive uh, uh, exclusive uh, part of the business uh, but i'm guessing that uh, you have a, a, a widespread recognition among gamers and it's uh, for some studios it, it never happens for some studios it doesn't happen uh, until they do their i don't know fourth game or fifth so you're 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 pretty well lucky is is a bad word here right because it didn't yes. happen overnight 
but yes. do you kind of feel the 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 the, the um, maybe the pressure too uh, because because I'm guessing that's that's, that's always out there uh, also in the aviation industry but but do you feel that uh, that that you're in a made studio so so to use the the mafia reference that, that you're 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 a made studio with your made game and uh, and and you're out there and it's uh, you kind of need to appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, we had uh, very lucky, as you said. Uh, I think the, the luck came from the fact that uh, the first game was targeted at, uh, at a certain audience that was just reigniting uh, as, a, as, a, as a market. Today top-down uh, action RPG uh, genre, the Diablo-like uh, games. And I think we, uh, with the first game, we've managed to catch this sort of a rising tide, and that helped a lot. Uh, and of course, it helped a lot also on the when we released the game, uh, because that also played its part. Um, and uh, of course, we were not alone. There were a lot of people in the industry that supported uh, us with their know-how uh, and so on. So uh, I think uh, you know behind luck there was still a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears that was poured into the project. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, in nowadays you still need to have a certain dose of luck in whatever you do, uh, no matter if it games or anything else. Luck it plays a, a big part in that. Okay. So maybe can you tell us a bit about you, your story? Uh, pretty short because I know it, it can get uh, pretty long for for some people in the industry. Uh, but I would love to know your feedback because I'm guessing uh, that's that's that, that's a new story for uh, for all of the guys uh, listening to us uh, out there. Uh, when did you start? You know how how did you get that? Because uh, you know last time we had. Uh, um, we had Damon, that's the, uh, the CEO of Firdamic. That's that's he was he was uh, uh, a finance guy that eventually grew into being a CEO, and he's yeah. you know very grateful for for from jumping from the corporate slash finance stuff to to to, to being in the in the industry uh, in the position that he kind of you know can do games and. Um, and he was very happy about that, and I also do get that because I've never been a developer myself. But what's your story? Yeah, I think the story uh, we have to turn back the time quite a bit. Uh, the story starts when I was about twelve, and I got my first uh, PC, let's say, and I was exposed to this. Um, exposed is not a good word, man. Don't. don't. <laughs> It is because uh, you know it was the first time when I could actually interact uh, with this uh, amazing world of uh, the video games, and I, uh, you know, it was a sort of a, a passion at first sight. Uh, it was something that I, I really wanted to to explore further and to to learn how to make games, and uh, to I started coding. I started how to, to learn how to code. Uh, and I think it guided some of my decisions, early decisions in life, in regards to the kind of uh, high school, high school I would I would go or university and so on and so forth. Um, and then professionally, I started in two thousand and three, and I really started the like the the very classical, uh, traditional routes with uh, an entry level position in QA, and then gradually I. Uh, I moved uh, up as a lead tester and then uh, moved into um, designing uh, games uh, and then uh, jumping into project management and producing games. And then, of course, I started uh, having more appetite to explore other uh, areas of, uh, of game development because it's more than just uh, development that makes or breaks uh, a game. It's also about customer support and business development and publishing and all uh, sorts of uh, other areas which uh, contribute to the success um, of a game. So I've tried to learn uh, different and I, I 
my roles uh, changed. So I tried to learn a bit of everything to understand exactly how uh, things are working. Uh, I also uh, had my own company for a while. And uh, when the pandemic uh, hit, we, uh, we stopped with it. Um, and then I went a bit into consulting. And uh, uh, yeah, since 2020, I, uh, I am uh, part of Wilson. I uh, initially joined Wilson as a consultant, then uh, full time opening the, uh, the Romanian studio. So the first uh, studio of um, outside of France for Wilson. And then uh, starting uh, last year around uh, June, I uh, I became the the guy who is uh, managing the entire uh, the entire company, um, and uh, yeah, so that's pretty much in a nutshell. And I think um, you know, as an anecdote, um, when my mom was seeing me playing so many games, and uh, you know, not doing that great in school anymore for a while because I was just. Uh, spending too much time in front of the screen. Uh, she started uh, telling me that I will never uh, do anything with just that to, to you know, make money out of it. And I should really get my head together and uh, learn a real job. Um, so my I parents, think, uh, my parents tell me the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's not a unique thing, but it happened to me as well. And uh, I think part of the motivation besides the passion was to also prove to my my folks that actually you can make money um, out of this and you can make a career out of it. Uh, and it's good to to combine passion with with the job. Uh, it's uh, I think uh, us in the gaming industry were very lucky that we are able to combine it. Right. Um, okay. Uh, what do you think? Or maybe let's get d d dropped into uh, like the industry uh, talk with some. Uh, Selling so many you know, copies of, of, of Walton uh, in a very specific uh, market, uh, and well, not a niche, but at some points, like the cornerstone of of, uh, of games as they are, uh, because you know, action RPG, whatever uh, the the the, the uh, this zone of industry is called right now, it's a. Uh, it's hard to not notice that there, that there there always been games like that, and there there always been a, a very uh, small group of studios who and games that really made it. Uh, and as mentioned, you you obviously did. Um, so what can you tell me about? Uh, and you mentioned also the the the, the wave that you kind of used up um, with Walson premiering. So what's the scope right now? Where are action RPG games right now? Uh, comparing to to like a few years back or uh, around Volsman premiere or at least the last two three years, there was a future out there because uh, uh, I'm guessing that uh, that that uh, I'm not sure if Diablo Four has has you know become whatever anybody expected uh, in in this grand scale. Um, I liked it either way, uh, but but I was never perceived as a as a Hardcore, you know, Diablo player or whatever. Uh, but uh, but I'm 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 thinking what's what will happen next. What's your take on that? I mean, like in a lot of other uh, creative industries, I think uh, there's always a, a bit of a cycle. There are genres that um, genres don't don't disappear in games either. They just go through a, a bit of a hibernation period. Uh, it happened with strategy games, it happened with uh, action RPGs, yeah. it happened with a lot of different genres of the industry where the market got oversaturated and then uh, they went into a bit of a hibernation period, but then the appetite came back and more and more companies are uh, uh, are going on onto that, and I think that with the action RPG genre in particular, the the situation is pretty much similar. Um, as I was saying, when Wilson was launched, there was already a bit of a wave uh, rising. We had Grim Dawn already uh, out. We had Path of Exile, uh, so there was already um, 
the genre was already making a comeback. And of course, more and more uh, titles came out. Um, I think why there are not as many titles uh, like action RPG compared to first-person shooters, for example, is that it's because they are pretty tough to make, create. You need a lot of design, you need a lot of uh, time to, to invest and to spend and to... Uh, because you also tr need to try to innovate a bit into what you're doing. You cannot just uh, rinse and repeat and expect a lot of success. I think we have a lot of examples from this year where not having enough uh, uniqueness, not having enough uh, uh, points of uh, attraction, uh, even with large budgets, you still end up uh, uh, unsuccessful. And uh, I think this is why the action RPG genre, while it will increase, and I think there is still room for growth, um, it will never become a, a main trend as uh, you know first-person shooters in terms of the amount of companies that develop these kind of games. Uh, as a user base, yes. I mean, Diablo 4 sold a lot uh, of copies. Path of Exile is doing incredibly well, and Path of Exile 2 is coming. Uh, Last Epoch has done uh, amazing as well. So you have quite a few success stories um, out there, which cater to, a, to, a, to an audience that grows bit by bit. And I think it's up to each of these companies, including ourselves, to come up with uh, additional elements of innovation to push the genre forward. Like uh, one, one example that I can give is that uh, um, back a few years ago, people were accustomed to just uh, play with uh, this kind of games, to just play it with mouse at point and click, and that's how they were playing it. Um, um, a few years back, and you, you see it already in, in the new generation of action RPGs, there was a, a transition towards the WSD movement, so the twin stick movement, which is uh, catering to a bit of a bigger audience. And, um, uh, you know, it's also much easier to adapt it for controllers and so on and so forth. So you need this sort of uh, innovations to keep the genre uh, relevant for what the audience expects. Um, and just creating a very bland, very classic experience, it's no longer enough to have success. Yeah, it's changed a bit uh, with, I don't know, maybe a bit Vampire Survivors, since it's uh, now you can see a few games being produced that are, are, are basically action RPGs joins or meets the Vampire Survivors. So it's a... Uh, um, so like an all idle RPG that's that's eventually uh that, that's a funny thing. That's uh at one point in, in, in the nineties or late nineties or early two thousands, uh whoever kind of wanted to, to, to do some RPG game, you know, Diablo said such, such a great sound that it was very difficult to uh, to catch up with it. And there's been like a huge trend, obviously in the Asian markets, uh for years and years for browser games and so on. And now mobile games that picked up, uh, well, idle RPGs in the end, but eventually uh, throughout the years on uh, some variations of RPG uh, games that that uh, hoped to have the, the the hack and slash element, but at, at times didn't have, uh, or it was some variation of, of a turn based uh, uh, phenomenon. And then in the end, we've got now uh, uh, both cycles kind of met where uh, uh, where we have games that. Uh, Look and feel like uh, an isometric action RPG or hack and slash variation, but eventually are in the idle RPG slash vampire survivors game. That's that's a uh, that's a funny thing. And also we have a lot of uh, isometric uh, survivor survivals game that that you build your base, you craft. You go around also killing stuff, and, and the hack and slash element is there. So now the 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 real hack and slash slash auction RPG from twenty years ago it grew into like three or four different genres or subgenres in uh, in it all. And to be honest, it's 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 it started off uh, with that. 
and also having like the double A, triple A uh, auction produce like you, like the Walton, they're at the you know creme de la creme level of, of it all. So it's fun to see, uh, and that's that's uh, that's where the crowd is at. It's it's in like several places. Um, and it's it's uh, it's influenced by by a lot of uh, gamers and obviously uh, by a bit uh, the Asian markets uh, and the mobile market and uh, and that's also a change a big with uh, uh, Diablo Immortal was you know unthinkable in the early two thousands right to have that and you already have that and I I think that's that's also a, a thing of the future that uh, each and every game would uh, should have. A variation of a, of a mobile solution because it's it's just great to have to, to to play that specific type of game in a in a comfortable environment of of while traveling. But that's 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 that. Uh, uh, you've been to Gamescom. You yeah. had stuff done there, uh, so maybe uh, uh, before we plunge into more of, on you guys, uh, what do you think about Gamescom? Where where you are right now uh, as an industry? And how you see it? How how was the vibe that you're getting? Uh, because you have this unique uh, p- p- position to to be somewhere from uh, from the east, uh, well, not like east east far east, but but central eastern Europe, like 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 me, like us in uh, in Galactus. And we kind of I I see the difference between Western and Eastern Europe. That there's a fine line between there, and those are two different industries. Um, and I would love to, to hear your take on this. Where are we right now, and where are we heading? Um, Gamescom was very interesting uh, to me personally because there was a lot of uh, there was a, a mix of emotions that I could grasp and feel uh, in in me interacting with different people that I've met there, from you know the publishing side, de- uh, federal development studios, uh, media. Uh, players and so on and so forth and um, there is this sort of a mixture between um, on the one hand excitement uh, which is I think uh, something that anyways you feel when you go to this sort of uh, an event Uh, but uh, there was also a lot of um, there was some fear there was some uh, cautiousness uh, and um, I think a lot of people uh, still don't know uh, what and how will this industry evolve in the next 12 to 18 uh, months? Um, because uh, there are a lot of uh, unknowns. As you saw left and right, we have a lot of uh, companies uh, shutting down, a lot of layoffs. Uh, um, and that affects the morale of people. Uh, there's uh, deals that go under. Um, there's a lack of uh, cash and a uh, big need of cash on the other hand um, money is still quite expensive to get so I think that uh, you know it's not very easy to to, to foresee where uh, where things can can evolve the, the the motto before games come at the beginning of the year that was let's survive to 2025 now I've seen more the transition towards let's just survive uh, yeah. So it's um, it's really uh, that th- there is a lot of uh, fear of unknown. Um, of course, uh, the pandemic helped the industry, but it also uh, handicapped it a bit because I think that a lot of companies grew to match the uh, the hunger for content, um, and there was a lot of investments and and so on. But once the pandemic uh, ended and people came back to their uh, regular uh, life habits, uh, work, going to the office, and so on and so forth, I think it started to. Uh, and usually, entertainment is towards the end of the of this uh, butterfly effect or domino effect, and we see now the results of of that over hiring, over spending. Overinvestment. You uh, just don't need that many games. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a matter of recalibration, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, it's a matter of recalibration. You and yes, maybe one of the things is that we have 
too much content and it's harder to uh, put your game out there. Um, so yes, there will be a period of, uh, of recalibration for sure that will still continue. Um, and I think that new types of businesses and business models will appear uh, out of this, uh, this uh, let's say, tremors and earthquakes that we're going through right now. Um, I still think that the industry has a lot of potential, uh, and I I firmly believe that uh, the, the industry will uh, grow even further. But my biggest fear right now, to be honest, is the fact that we are a bit following in the footsteps of the of what happened in, with the Hollywood movie industry. Um, and we are going through the same commotions at, at, as the movie industry went. And we didn't learn that much from uh, their mistakes, unfortunately. So we are repeating the same mistakes. And everybody's searching, unfortunately. Um, don't you think that we kind of... Uh, there are a few things uh, around COVID and around Gamescom. Um, but I kind of had the feeling that we... Uh, over over COVID, around COVID, we 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 uh, thought of, fought with uh, uh, with uh, or well, we we got remote work, which was yeah. Now we see that it's 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 a golden standard, right? It's it's people like working from home uh, in the end, and uh, and the industry was a bit overtired, overstretched, overcrushed. And that needed to change. So that was an initial new thing. That was not. The, the, we had some movement along that way uh, to, uh, uh, to 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 fight with that, uh, but never got like the real push. And during COVID, we got the push that hey, people can't work in those environments, right? Game dev is that that should be a normal business that you can't crash for two three months. Uh, before the premiere, because it's 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 too bad for, uh, it's bad for people in in the long run, and people burn out, and obviously all the different uh, I don't know uh, uh, issues with you know GamerGate, bro culture, uh, sexual scandals, whatever. We had a, a, at least a few big issues. And it turns out that I had the feeling that during COVID we kind of started working on those, and and, and kind of were aiming or going through or heading to to some uh, solution or or to some I don't know clarity point uh, or we started uh, figuring things out, and at some point it it, it got stopped because the industry got uh, uh, not crashed but into well. Cat banked the wall or, or the crisis came, whatever. Because I'm not sure if you've seen that on on Gamescom. I've I've seen that some studios, some publishers, some people in the industry, they don't say there's a crisis at all. There are some that say there is a big crisis. There's a deep crisis in the in the industry. And to be honest, I'm not sure what's the case anymore, because I've seen so many games uh, at Gamescom that got funded. Although they were barely games, and you know, you do you right. You, if you got the money, do the game. That's fun, right? But I've seen so many games that that shouldn't get the money, and and they eventually did. And on the other hand, I've seen you know very talented studios that that mm. that get no funding at all, uh, and that's that's the uh, beauty of the market and the beauty of the, of the of the industry. So, can we get to this point where we? Kind of sit down, sit down as an industry, and then really approve the, the like industry standards that you know we shouldn't be working sixty hours a week, that people shouldn't be fired just like that as as they do in Poland. They're everywhere around, right? You see a project being cut, and it's three hundred people off. So it's 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 a difficult uh tiring job and a stressful one but we haven't even figured out the standards of the industry uh are we getting closer to any point because i i, I see like the, the the crisis if it if it if it's if it's out there if it's real 
it kind of broke the cycle or broke the the, the uh, our move forward. I'm I'm not sure what will happen now. Will, will we be getting back to the on track with uh, with this positive change that should have happened in the industry years ago? Really? Um, well, there's a lot of uh, of things here. Uh, in what you in what you said, yeah, I know, I know. But if we start with the the, the remote work part, right? Um, definitely, the pandemic uh, opened the eyes of a lot of people and uh, forced uh, them to realize that you know when you work from home, you have a lot of advantages. You have more time for uh, spending time with your family. Uh, and uh, while we still take care of uh, of things at work, uh, um, but of course, if you do that for a long period of time, some people can adjust to that. Some people can't. You have people that, and I've talked to, they have friends in the industry that prefer to go to the office. Um, and I think that uh, why? Because they they feel that when you work from home. The biggest issue there is that you do not have any more boundaries between work and personal life. You pretty much have everything in the same place. You just you sit in front of your computer, you work, you stand up, and you are already uh, in into the personal part of your life. And I think uh, for some people this is uh, this is tough to to manage, and uh, they prefer to actually go in a in a place. And I think that. The best thing that companies can do is to offer the possibility to for people to go to the office whenever they want. Um, unfortunately, what I've seen, uh, and uh, I think you saw it, you saw it too, is that companies are starting to to implement this return to office policy, which is either full time or uh, hybrid. Um, and I think. Uh, I mean, everybody decides what they want to do in, with their strategies uh, and with their companies. But uh, I feel that it's very hard to... People already went through a big uh, emotional uh, impact when they had to isolate themselves and, and work from home. Um, but they managed to adapt to that, uh, most of them. Now you are asking them again to change their way of living which is not very easy to do. Some of these people moved away from the big cities that were more expensive and they ended up working remotely from, you know, uh, the suburbs or even uh, small towns and uh, rural areas. Why? Because they felt that, you know, why should I pay uh, double the rent in a, uh, for an apartment in, uh, in downtown when I can just have a, a little house and I can rent out or buy a house somewhere up in, up in the hills. So my quality of life is getting better. And now if you ask those guys to come back into the office, they're doomed because they can't. They're too far away. They can't commute 100 kilometers uh, every day uh, back and forth. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, if we want to fix uh, us, is we need to put our people first, our employees, our collaborators. If we do not do that, it's very hard. Um, and crunch time, yeah, crunch time, I mean, you can imagine in the 20 plus years that I've had in the industry, I had periods in which um, I had to crunch. And I won't lie that there aren't some, you know, small good parts of that, of, uh, extra team uh, building uh, that you get uh, people feel that they're together in the trenches and whatnot so that's the good part unfortunately it comes with a very high cost and i'm not talking here about the monetary part but uh, you know health and family and everything um and i think that uh, this crunch culture is something that uh, you know it's in the power of each of us to reduce bit by bit you can't do it overnight but you can uh, implement processes and procedures to make sure that you reduce them to the point in which you don't don't have to, uh, and the teams don't have to do them anymore. Um, so it's 
it, it's a it's a change of mentality for sure, but it can be done. Uh, and I think that uh, you need to you really need to to put this as a priority as a company if you really want to do something about it. just declaring that you don't want to do crash time is not enough. You need to actually uh, put in place some guardrails to prevent and limit as much as possible the crash. Okay. What about um, what about the big publishers? Because of of uh, because you you self published uh, yes. uh, also, and yes. um, yeah, maybe let's let's start with that because I'm uh, I'm guessing that uh, big publishers are always a, a, a nice topic to to to, uh, to cover. Uh, it's always fun uh, if if you know Ubisoft gets you know kicked a bit. But then again, they're 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 part of the of of of, uh, of the business. Whatever they do is is kind of influencing us in the long run. Um, what what was the story of, of you self publishing? Um, how difficult it was, and um, and you know what 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 lessons you guys have, um, also for future because um, I'm guessing in a difficult world of uh, of getting a publisher, self publishing is is. Uh, it's bigger than ever, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's more and more studios that are trying to self-publish or find a way to self-publish, or even find partners that offer this sort of publisher as a service uh, approach in which they can provide uh, some of the services that uh, the, the traditional publishers are offering, but taking a much smaller uh, percentage of the of the rev share. So they can still do marketing, they can still do PR, they can still do community management, uh, maybe even QA localization and so on, but without taking an arm and a leg. Uh, and uh, yeah, for the people that can do it, I think it's a very good uh, approach because you don't have to necessarily invest the, 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 the money into building your own self-publishing capabilities. Ideally, of course, you'll be able to do that. And uh, that will give you a lot of uh, uh, autonomy in what you're doing. Um, but the publishers are not evil, okay? They are there for a, for a big reason, for a very important reason. And the main reason is the fact that there's a lot of talented teams out there that, you know, they, they, they have, you know, some extremely good games, but they don't have the, the funding necessary to take those games over the finish line. So. Publishers are still uh, relevant, and they can help a lot. Of course, they can also, uh, you know, uh, do a, not a great job uh, because your project is not that important to them. But uh, if you do your due diligence as a as a as a development uh, studio, when you discuss with publishers, you can identify the the good ones from the not so good ones, or the ones that are actually the best fit for what you need uh, and uh, to make sure that they have the, the services that you need and also the, the, to make sure that the culture, their culture and with your own internal culture are a pretty good fit because if those cultures don't match at all, uh, it's going to be a, a hell of a right to, to work with, with such a publisher and release your game. Um, so yeah, and other than that, I mean, I joined Wilson after uh, Lords of Mayhem was released. Well, the Lords of Mayhem was released in February. I joined in June, so a few months after. Um, but I think a few lessons that we've learned uh, the hard way. Um, first of all, it's about uh, community. I think that uh, community is very important uh, for developing the game in 2024. Um, and what other studios did before us uh, successfully with community-driven development, like uh, the guys from Amplitude or uh, the guys who did Subnautica, are examples that can we can all learn from in order on on how they interacted, how they grew their communities, how they uh, in you know build uh, them up, uh, and uh, how they. Uh, the kind of transparency that they had, um, and so on. And I think that uh, you need this sort of uh, 
a strong community to back you, as especially if you want to self-publish, it becomes uh, quintessential to have a community and to build a community very early on uh, when you develop games, um, because they are the ones that uh, can support you, and it's better to be uh, transparent and as honest as possible with with them when it comes to the where things are. Right, uh, and uh, we had some uh, very interesting uh, discussions uh, at Gamescom, but even before that, uh, with some uh, people from the from the media, and uh, it was uh, refreshing to to see the fact that even what when we showed them something that was not yet ready, or you know, like when we gave them the disclaimer, okay, this is still in progress or very early alpha or, you know, prototype state or whatever, they were actually uh, happy to see that uh, we are so frank with them and we do not try to hide things and uh, and so on. And I think that the communities uh, are the same. And at the end of the day, we're all human beings. Uh, trust is something that is key for any sort of uh, human relations. If you do not trust uh, the people around you, if you do not, uh, if the community doesn't trust you as a developer that you're going to do a great job and that their uh, voice is uh, heard, then they will uh, stop supporting your game. They will stop playing it, they will stop giving you feedback, and gradually they will become uh, aggressive towards you and partially they are right to do so. So I think that one of the big lessons learned uh, is this. Uh, Love your community. Community matters, and without it, you can't achieve much nowadays. Okay. Where's, where in that community-driven discussion is Concord and Autos? Because those are two different situations. To be honest, I'm, to, to, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what happened. But two big titles, they, they, they have some issues, right? Outlaws maybe less than Conquer, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's a difficult time, right? Straight after Gamescom, you've got a pretty big game that gets closed after a week. Yes, that's, 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 um, there's obviously a flop, but then again, was it unexpected? I mean, depends on who you ask. Or, um, you as a, as a as an industry, you know, expert and, and veteran. For uh, me, for me, regarding Concord, uh, you know, all the respect for the people that worked on the on the project, and I think they they've tried their, their best to do something that is uh, good. Um, the biggest problem with Concord is the fact that uh, um, they have. I'm sorry to say so, uh, but they have no unique selling points. They don't stand out with anything. And I think this is what actually a lot of uh, media outlets and, and players realize. That's why their sales are so bad and they ended up deciding to shut down everything and actually refund uh, everybody who purchased the game. Um, they were just not able to position the game uh, in a way that uh, it's appealing for uh, for uh, for the market. So maybe we have learned from something or know yes. better than Hollywood. Hollywood doesn't return your tickets right after a bad movie. <laughs> it's a bad premiere, and the studio says, "Okay, what can you do?" Right? They, let's move on to the next uh, project. But games are different in that that way. We we've got you know redemption stories. We've got returns we've got apologies we've got sorry well we are you know trying to uh, treat our, our employees differently we, we were a bit of a different industry I, I i don't think anybody in hollywood would return uh you know movie tickets or whatever no movie tickets no I, but if we're talking about retail for sure there are some returns there uh as well. Um, but I think it's also a very different thing. A movie, once it's done, it's done. You cannot release a patch to fix your movie. Yeah. You cannot say, hey, you know what? I, we understood that uh, you don't like the way 
uh, the actor uh, voiced or you know uh, acted on that scene. So here's uh, an improved version with that scene fixed. Nobody does that in the industry in the movie business. You know what you see is what you get, and that's it. That's the final product, and whether you like it or not, that's what it is. In gaming, uh, we have the the luxury, so to say, even if it come if it's costly to actually improve and fix the experiences that we are providing to the to the players if we listen to their uh, to their feedback. Um, I think that um, Cyberpunk is a wonderful redemption story, to be honest. The yep. game initially released and uh, it was, uh, we, we all know, we don't have to go into details, but they, they were able to make a comeback. They were able to, to, to transform and fix the, the issues that they had and uh, they kept on uh, doing it up until they were able to appease the community. So I think it's really something that we can look towards. Uh, um, I'm not sure if you had that similar type of conversation on Gamescom or around, but but I've I've had it a few times. Uh, that Cyberpunk is no longer uh, considered, uh, you know, a, a, a excuse my friend, but a fuck up story. It's no longer a, a um, it's still a bit of a redemption story, right? But I think right now it's also a story of. Uh, uh, it's been four years. It's it's been a lot of time, a lot of changed uh, around it, and in the industry. And I see right now. I've seen it through through in, in a few of my conversations that Cyberpunk is is treated as as a as a wise lesson to us all, meaning that although that it's been a dire situation, uh, a a crazy big one. And eventually, something good grew out of it. I, I think some people, not in, in, in included or involved in cyberpunk at all, uh, I think myself included, I would say I'm, I'm proud of 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 the way the uh, project handled that. But we, as an industry, handled that, and that's a story of 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 uh, how can we become better uh, in you know just treating ourselves. Uh, with respect, uh, in the end, so that's that that story kind of elevated itself up. I'm not sure if you you had that uh, uh, that approach somewhere in your uh, in your industry conversations. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I think uh, because the CD Project was known for their Witcher series, and Cyberpunk was actually the first foray outside of that universe. Uh, it was challenging to to, to do uh, and to to uh, you know to create a community around a completely different game with a different art style and different setting and everything else. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, you know us as game developers, but also as gamers, um, CD Projekt is one of those companies that we look up to in terms of quality and what they can deliver and everything else. And I think that was also one of the reasons why people in the industry as well rooted for, uh, for you know, this redemption and to, uh, they, they cheered on uh, and they were happy to see that uh, things uh, managed to, you know, the company managed to, to fix uh, the things and fix the game and uh, appease the community. Um, you mentioned also Outlaws. Outlaws is a very different situation, in my opinion. It's a good game. Uh, it's a good game, and um, I think that if you look at the Metacritic score, it shows. You know, it's 70 plus, it's all green across the board. The team has done, again, they, they worked a lot on, on, on the game, and uh, they, they poured all their uh, passion and skill into that. Um, so it's a bit of a more of a mixed bag than in the case of uh, Concord, right? I, I just think that um, Star Wars as an IP um, just transformed in the last decade or so. And for people that are still sticklers for the original version of the universe, any sort of changes that happened 
they reacted negatively towards it. And that's why you have uh, the, the, the player score so much lower, five, six, and whatnot. Um, but again, I mean, now it's only a matter of uh, seeing what the team and what Ubisoft will do in order to fix it and fix the relationship with the community. Because the game just released, so they still have time to I'm, do I'm, I'm not sure if that's a far stretch, but I, I somehow believe that uh, Acolyte TV series didn't help uh, to them because it's it's we had a period where Disney Star Wars was you know praised right for uh, for for uh, for a few things for a few movies I don't know Rogue One but also uh, Andor and and and, it went, and, it, and a few in between but then again now they're on a, on a, on a, on a way down so I'm not sure if the if that kind of influenced. Uh, whatever happened with the outlaws, but um, but I also seen a, a bunch of videos that that you know that the game is not performing at all. It's it, it's not about you know wokeness or no wokeness. It's it's still about the mechanics or or just the bugs or whatever. Uh, so I'm guessing that's uh, uh, yeah, that's that's unforgivable again. And I'm, I'm I'm thinking that it's uh, at some point it 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 outgrew the scale of it all, and people just got mad. And there's a boiling point that you kind of can't cross with games, right? Because there's, there's a, you don't have that line with music industry or, or, or Hollywood or, uh, or whatever, right? or whatever other entertainment industry. We, we've got that boiling point where you can't piss off your crowd, right? Because it's, it's, you can crush. Uh, and that's that. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, at, at the end of, of it all, uh, uh, thank you very much for, for, for being here. But can you tell us a bit more on uh, what's next for you guys? Um, no. I, I, I do know that you can't say a lot. <laughs> so uh, uh, whatever you can say, uh, that'll be much appreciated. Because I'm guessing it, you, you do. And I, I, We've talked about it. I know you know uh, that you have um, uh, a heavy burden or, or a responsibility or whatever it's called but but you've got a lot of to a lot to uh work up to and and prove and deliver and uh anything you do will be kind of looked very thoroughly by the community by media outlets by influencers um, and I do know that you that you get that uh, but can you tell us a bit more on um on what's next for for you for Vaults and um uh, Again, what can you say? What, whatever you, whatever you can say, uh, the, whatever you can't, that's fine too. We'll get another round, like in a few months, then maybe we'll be able to tell more a bit. But uh, <laughs> I think that's a teaser podcast. You know, that's a, that's a teaser podcast for for our yeah. second episode in a few months. Yeah, I mean, we we are also embarking a bit on a redemption arc as as well. Um, I mean, Wilson, Birds of Mayhem, we had the luck to sell a lot of uh, units, but as I said, you know, we learned a lot, especially on how to interact with or how not to interact with the community. And I think that this is going to be one of the toughest uh, challenges that we will be facing in the, and this is one of our focuses, and this is what we're working on uh, right now is to how to um, uh, make peace with the community. Uh, that we have and how to grow it uh, because we have a lot of uh, have three different projects in development in different stages and uh, we uh, we look forward to start sharing them with the with the community and get feedback so there's a lot uh, going on uh, Gamescom was very uh, busy for us um, because we had one game in the consumer area one game um showcasing it to, to media behind closed doors and another one presenting it to different publishing partners so we had a chance to uh, you know to, to 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 do all of that and uh yeah i mean in the next uh, few months we're gonna start announcing uh some of these games and uh, then it's up to us to to make sure that uh we've learned and we can prove that to to the to the community that we've learned from our past mistakes 
and we're going to do better second time around. Um, because the team is much bigger right now, the team is more experienced. Uh, we've hired a lot of talent from everywhere across the globe. Um, and uh, now it's up to us to prove that uh, we are much more mature as a team. And we understand much better what we need to do in order to uh, to repeat the success. Because I think this is one of the the biggest challenges uh, any company, any game development company has. Um, of course, the first challenge is to actually make a game that is successful. But the second challenge, and sometimes I think it's even bigger than the first one, is can you repeat that success? Can you piggyback yeah. on the first game success and create even better experiences for your audience. I think that's the challenge that we are facing right now with the second wave of projects. And uh, yeah, I think uh, the teams are very excited and uh, look, really look forward to start uh, interacting and sharing uh, uh, builds with uh, with our players, future players. Great. Um Thank you very much for that. So something's cooking, uh, and you'll, you'll hear about it in uh, yeah. in a while. Uh, again, a, a, a teaser approach uh, that, that we have right now. Um, yeah. uh, and as a last thing, uh, any words of advice for, for the young guys out there? Uh, uh, women and men getting into game dev or starting their first job? Um or, or maybe a second one, but but also thinking about going uh, indie and doing a self-publishing deal or, or whatever they, they might be thinking at. Uh, what's, what's like, you know, you, you can give a few advices, you can give just one golden one. What can you tell to, to the next generation of, uh, uh, of game developers uh, that you probably have also seen at Gamescom? Because I've seen a lot of 20, 21-year-olds pitching games so uh so that's that's a whole new generation because those guys don't remember the 90s uh that they don't remember you know early 2000s uh, uh that they don't remember need for speed was wanted right so that's 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 like huge generations ago uh and they're, they're here they're, they're making new games they're, they're out there they're, they're uh they're coming for our jobs obviously uh, but outside of that, uh, what words of wisdom can you can you give those guys? To keep following their passion and not give up. Uh, there will be ups and downs. Uh, they might get rejections from publishers, but the right partner will come up. If they believe in their, uh, in their game and if they believe in their talents, sooner or later, they will make it. It's just they need to have a lot of grit and I think that's the most important thing that you need to have nowadays, uh, grit and resilience, um, because the industry is tough. It's much tougher than 20 years ago, um, and the competition is much, uh, much, much bigger. Uh, but uh, I've seen some amazing uh, creative ideas at Gamescom and uh, in various uh, online media from very small teams so there is still a lot of room for creativity and for creative projects, even for small teams, and they can find a success. But they just need to believe in themselves and they need to be prepared for a um, for a roller coaster ride because game development is like that. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, it's been a, a, a real pleasure. Uh, good luck on your, uh, well, again, three projects in the work. So that's uh, that's an update that uh, uh, that looks good. Uh, all the best uh, on the process. I know that you've been working around for for a while now, so it's it's uh, uh, we're we're kind of knowing that three projects that at uh, at at a stage that they're already uh, you know uh, uh, being done for 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 years. Um, so thank you again for for being here. Thank you for for your feedback. I'll, I'll I'd love to have you around again in a few months that you can tell a bit more about the projects, especially that one project that uh, I'm guessing everybody's thinking of. Uh, but um, again, 
let's let's hear about it in uh, in a while um and for now thank you very much and um but yeah godspeed and let's uh it was a real pleasure and looking forward to our next uh conversation in a few months yeah thank you very much then uh thank you everybody for for uh, watching uh and and or listening uh if you got any uh questions for bargain after after this uh, uh please do so i'll i'll I'm in direct contact with the guy so I can pass on any questions. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and let's uh, hear each other probably next week. Thank you very much. Take care, All guys. Right. Bye. Bye.